Good morning. Good morning. Welcome home to Trinity, a place of sharing the gospel and growing God's family. Today we have the privilege of Jacob Hine being here. He's a seminary student up in Milwaukee, uh, in Mequon, Wisconsin. He uh, graduated from Illinois Lutheran High School a few years ago, a few years ago, and uh, he's going to be leading our worship this morning. It's a great privilege having you back here, Jacob. Uh, before we get into the service, let's watch this month's Wells Connection video. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. It's no surprise that the day-to-day -day work of missions will vary a lot depending on the culture. We expect that in world mission settings. The same is true here in the United States. Our approach to outreach should reflect the needs of the community, and one place that's clearly visible is in Detroit. Few cities were more ravaged by the last economic downturn than Detroit. As crime, drugs, and broken families increase, the need for the gospel message is clear. For Pastor Ryan Colander of Palabra de Vida Lutheran Church, the way to reach this community is to engage the people here face to face. Most every day, he gets in his car and visits members, and potential members, in their homes and workplaces. It's the kind of relationship building this largely Latino neighborhood deeply appreciates. How are you doing? All is good. A lot of individual visits and being with people, um, which is just fun. Bueno, si la baby, la baby. A lot of first time Christians, people who don't have a Christian background. It's real hands on, um, on the ground, in homes, a lot of teaching, presenting the gospel for the first time to people. Like John said, less of me and more of Christ. Mm. Love it. For families like the Greens, who do not come from a church background, visits like this and a congregation that cares have made a difference. My dad's never been to church. Uh, he never really met his dad. Uh, my, my grandma doesn't really go to church. It's just, I just wanted to break that. I didn't want that to keep going on. The church has been wonderful a wonderful place and they've helped so much and thank God for that and Pastor Ryan and all the congregation and everybody that's I've met throughout the time we've been there. It's been really good for me and my family and for the connection between me and God and our family. When I go to church, everybody's just so happy to see you. It's welcoming, it's loving, you know, they, it's, a, it's a home that I, I am so thankful for. The congregation is also served by Pastor Ismael Sailer who likewise is committed to connecting with Latino families in their home environment. This meeting allows him to talk about Jesus with 10 children, all from the same family. The gospel is so important here in Detroit, especially among the Hispanic community, because the community in a lot of ways is disoriented and needs to hear the sacred scriptures. In-home visitation and instruction takes time, but God has used these efforts to build a strong congregation, a church that now benefits from a connection to brothers and sisters in neighboring Wells congregations. Morning, Jeremy, how are you? Peace Lutheran School in the suburbs is a 30-minute drive from central Detroit and the members of Palabra de Vida. 
but a dozen families bring their children here every school day. When Jesus came to this earth, he came to not only fulfill his father's will, but he also came to perform miracles, preach the word, teach the word, and spread the gospel. The relationship between the school at peace and the families of Palabra de Vida benefits both. These children receive a quality Christian education, and this suburban church is given an opportunity for outreach. We don't just reach out to our own, but that we reach out into the communities and we reach out to all of those that are part of God's world. And if we are not mission-minded, we aren't doing what he asks us to do wanting to bring people together. That's like your passion, I can tell. Mission work like this depends on the support of Wells members everywhere. By working together, God can use us to do the most important work of all. You can't really put a price or a feeling on you know, such generosity from other people that like I have never met, I don't know anything about, but I just feel very blessed to have some, at least knowing that there's other people that care about me. Okay, okay. Pastor, yeah. thank you for See coming. Ya. All right. See you guys. Okay. Home mission congregations have many partners, including <coughs> Lutheran elementary schools like the one you just saw at Peace Lutheran. Through these partnerships, we pray Christ instills a mission mindset in all who are involved. It's exciting when God opens our eyes to see a whole new community, to serve His kingdom in ways we might never have imagined. To learn more about home missions, visit wells.net forward slash home missions. I love how things tie together. Uh, this summer, Jacob's going to be do going down to Argentina uh, using the Spanish. He first started learning at Illinois Lutheran High School and continued in, in college. Um, in some work of sharing God's word. What, what, a, great, what a great thing. Um, today we are concluding our sermon series, Turning Points. It is Palm Sunday. And so we see Jesus turning toward Jerusalem, ultimately toward the cross and the empty tomb. Our opening hymn for today is hymn 131, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. We'll sing the first three verses. <laughs>
Please stand for worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O God. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God. Let us worship him. Our scripture lead, reading comes from Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The word of the Lord. We continue with singing the psalm of the day found on page 73 in your hymnals.
Our second reading comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. And, made, and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above all names, that at the very name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. Our gospel comes from Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 to 40. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent went and found it just as he told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, throw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. We continue with singing hymn 133.
brothers and sisters in Christ. Today we bring to a close the sermon series, Turning Points. The idea behind it has been that you know, we all have these moments, these points in our lives where a decision going one way or the other affects the rest of our life. Today being Palm Sunday, we see Jesus at a rather large turning point, which also then means it's a rather large turning point for us as well. It is where Jesus turns toward Jerusalem. We're looking at the gospel reading for today, uh, which we heard earlier from Luke chapter 19. And um, at first, it seems like we see Jesus telling his disciples to turn toward stealing. It seems like that. It isn't. But that's what it seems like. Let's look again at what Luke chapter 19 says. As Jesus, after Jesus said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Tell them, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent, uh, went ahead and found it just as he told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. So, so what exactly was Jesus asking them to do? It, it, it seems like he was telling them to go steal a colt. I mean, can you imagine being one of those disciples? Jesus, you, you, you want me to do what? It'd be like him telling us today to, to go up to a complete stranger's house into their driveway um, where they have this brand new car. You, you check if the door's open. You open it up because it is, and you look for keys under the, the visor, and it's there, and you start it up, and, and the owner comes running out of the house, maybe with a, a baseball bat or something coming at you, yelling. That, that's not going to end well. Probably a 911 call. But that's not how this ended. Here we see very clearly Jesus knew something more than those disciples did. As God in flesh, he knew that this owner would be fine with them borrowing this donkey. He was teaching those two disciples to trust him. He wasn't turning them toward stealing. Now, there was a crowd that was turning toward Lazarus. Um, and this we didn't hear about in our sermon text at all. But this is a good example why when you read one of the Gospels, one of the biographies of Jesus, it's always good to look at the other ones. Because often these other biographies fill in and give us some, some understanding, better understanding or, or deeper of what's going on. And that's the case here. Who was Lazarus? Perhaps you remember a few weeks ago, we were talking about turning away and, uh, um, and, and actually turning away from sin and turning in repentance. We're looking at this incident where, where Jesus used um, news events of the day in talking about repentance. But these news events were about people they just heard about, no one knew them personally. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but I, I told you that you know, when Jesus did deal with personal tragedy with someone he knew, he approached it in a different way. And I, I told you, if you wanted to see how he did that, look up John chapter 11. Amazing chapter in the Bible. And that's where we see Lazarus. Lazarus was a good friend of Jesus, a brother to, to Mary and Martha. And Lazarus got sick, and he died. It's an amazing chapter because there in John chapter 11, we, we get that little tiny verse, Jesus wept. When he was faced with a personal friend, and this personal tragedy, someone he knew, 
cared about who died. Jesus w- was overwhelmed with sorrow. He, he cried. And sometimes we, I, I don't think we always think of Jesus having feelings and emotions like that, but he did. The other amazing thing about John chapter 11 is not only does it show us how Jesus felt, it shows us what he does about death. Take a look at here what uh, says near the end of John chapter 11. He's come to the tomb. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Now what Jesus did there with Lazarus, that had a direct impact on Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday happened not that much after John chapter 11. So let's take a look at John 12. There in John chapter 12, it says, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. The next day, a great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So let's think about this for a moment. What would you do if you could talk to someone who had died but was alive again? What would you do if you could talk to someone who had been in heaven but was now back? What what would you ask them? Would you ask them if they had seen your your mom or your your spouse, your child, your, your friend that had died? We, we all know that you know, when, when you hear some story, there's a book made or a movie made about someone who, who they say died for a few minutes and they saw a little bit of heaven. You know how much people buy that book and go see that movie. And you, you always wonder, if, you know, is it real or not? Well, this, this was real. Lazarus was right there. So you can imagine the crowds, when they heard about this, the crowds that went to see Lazarus and talked to him, And now, Jesus, the one who rose Lazarus, was right there too? Well, then they started following Jesus. Now, just to give you an idea and understanding of of how all this is working, here's a map of Jerusalem, okay? So so Jerusalem, you you see on the right, on the left. on On the right, then, is the city of Bethany. That's where Lazarus lived, Mary and Martha. And there's that little town, Bethphage, and then goes into Jerusalem. Now, I don't know if you know this, but, but Jerusalem is actually up in the mountains. And so when Jesus is going to Jerusalem, they, the Bible always calls it that they're going up to Jerusalem because they literally are going up to Jerusalem. Now, Jesus started further out, um, further out to the, the right, to, to the east, by Jericho. Jericho is in the river valley, the Jordan River, so it's down and to go up to the mountains, that the elevation change is about 3,500 feet change over only 17 miles. So that's quite a trek up to Jerusalem. And, of course, they didn't have cars back then. Very few had animals. Most people just walked. And, and they're going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Now, here's the thing. The, this, this ridge, the, the Mount of Olives, that's actually higher than the hill that Jerusalem is on. So, so as you're approaching Jerusalem, you actually don't see it until you get over that ridge, and then you can see Jerusalem down below you. 
just so you get an idea here, th this is a picture of modern day. Um, this is actually from Jerusalem looking up at the Mount of Olives. And, and then here, this is from the Mount of Olives looking down on Jerusalem. If you can see uh, kind of in the distance there, there's that gold dome. That's where the temple was in Jerusalem. And that valley before that, bet uh, between the Mount of Olives and, and Mount Zion where Jerusalem was, that's called the Kidron Valley. Now, okay, th this is 2,000 years after Jesus was there, so obviously it looks different. In fact, that, that valley has probably been filled in quite a bit. It would have been a little d substantially deeper. And just if you're curious, at this vantage point, what you see right in the foreground, that's an ancient Jewish cemetery, above-ground cemetery is what you're seeing there. But let's go back to the map, okay? So Jesus is there in Bethany. The, the crowds that come out to see Lazarus, and there's Jesus. Jesus starts going into Jerusalem, and he, he starts going that, down that hill into the Kidron Valley to go back up into Jerusalem. And the people, they, they came turning toward Lazarus, but now they were turning toward Jesus. Take a look what Luke chapter 19 says. They brought it to Jesus. This is the donkey. Threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in and, and loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. There are just a few things about what they were saying. The people were quoting Psalm 118. That was a psalm that the Jews always used to celebrate the Passover. So the, these large crowds of people, they're going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. That This psalm is, is very much on their minds, and they use it to honor, to, to praise Jesus as their king. This is the one who will save them. But they don't just cheer. They also got their coats, their cloaks, and they spread it on the floor. Some others um, broke off palm branches from the trees and, and waved those. And what, what those both things signified was laying coats on the ground and the palm branches were, were ways to honor a king, someone of nobility. They were praising Jesus. And the reason ultimately that we praise Jesus is because he turned toward Jerusalem. There are just a lot of contrasts on Palm Sunday, right? Jesus is being treated as a king even though he's riding on a donkey, not a stallion or anything like that. The crowds are praising and cheering him, and just in a few days, a crowd would be yelling, crucify him. The disciples were praising and yelling and shouting and, 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 and waving palm branches themselves, and later that week, they'd all be running away in fear. There's a lot of contrast here. What was Jesus turning toward? What do you think Jesus was feeling? I'm sure there was some, I, I guess, excitement and, and joy being with, with, Zach, uh, with, with Lazarus again and, and Mary Martha. That's probably, uh, actually, if you think about it, a roller coaster of emotions going through Jesus. Joy and, as the crowds are, are praising him, but also sadness because he knew a few decades later this entire city would be wiped, destroyed. Probably resilience or um, determination as he's turning toward Jerusalem knowing what that's going to mean. Turning toward Jerusalem, 
knowing that he would be abandoned by his disciples. Knowing he, he'd be arrested by them by the Jews, handed over to the Romans. Turning toward Jerusalem, knowing he'd go to that cross. Probably another feeling he had as he turned toward Jerusalem was overwhelming love. You know, a few weeks ago, I, um, I used the word reckless to describe God's love. What does reckless mean? It means without thinking or caring about the consequences of an action. Probably I should have explained that back when I first used it. Jesus knew the consequences. But he didn't care about that. He went forward. He turned toward All that for us. That's love. So what are you turning toward? You turning uh, away f- from the hard things and toward what's easy because that's what you want? turning away from the right choices because of the immediate gratification you want? Maybe not sure that actually describes you. Maybe look at your bank account. How many times in that do you see you spending money, turning towards something because you see it and, yeah, you want it? But looking at that account, do you also see the same action toward God's kingdom? What do we turn toward? What do we turn away from? Jesus? He didn't turn away from the hard. He turned right toward it and went to Jerusalem. He turned right toward the pain, the hardship. He went right toward the cross. He went right toward death for us, for our forgiveness. So, turn toward God in the beautiful and good things and in the hard times too. In other words, in everything, fix your eyes on Jesus. I don't know if you know this, but when you're driving, you drive wherever you look. You know, if, if, if you happen to see something off on the side and you start looking there, you're going to drift that way. Wherever you look in the road is where you're going to go. So turn your eyes and toward, fix them toward Jesus. That's where you're going to go. And praise him. Because if you, if you don't praise him, somebody will. The very end of our text says this. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Jesus will be praised. For us, for our salvation, he turned toward Jerusalem, knowing full well what that was going to mean. He will be praised. My friends, let that mean us then. As we turn our hearts toward Jesus, as we turn our hearts toward praising him in all we do, because he will be praised. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which transcends our understanding, guide and guard your hearts and minds unto life eternal. Amen. Let's join together in praising God. We use the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn. We continue with the offering.
Please stand for prayer. In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord of life, we thank you for blessing Chrissy Moeller with another grandchild as Pastor Dan and Hannah Margroff had a baby girl this week, Adeline Marie. Through baptism, bring little Adeline into your kingdom and keep her in the faith all her life until she joins you and all the saints at your side in heaven. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power, and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please be seated for the closing hymn. Good morning again. Welcome to all today, and certainly thank you, Jacob, for uh, being here and leading worship. Uh, I have a number of announcements since we are coming into Holy Week here. Um, I have a letter from Pastor Jesse Johnston, whom we had called to serve as our spiritual life pastor. Dear members of Trinity Lutheran Church, Philippians 1 says, I always thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. Over the last few weeks, I've had the privilege of speaking with Pastor Italiano and a number of leaders from Trinity about your ministry. From everything I heard and saw, Jesus blessed Trinity with a terrific pastor and leadership team. I think that your member ministry and vision planning are exemplary. Everything I heard about Illinois Lutheran School was overwhelmingly positive. 
Your desire to serve people well with the gospel and to reach more people with Christ was very evident. I thank the Lord for all his work among you and through you. Thank you also for joining me in praying for the wisdom of the Lord as, he, as I deliberated these calls. After prayer and many discussions, I am returning the call, declining the call, to serve as your spiritual life pastor. Though I would have loved serving with all of you and with Christ in his word uh, as your spiritual life pastor, Mount Calvary has some ministry opportunities that I would like to continue to see through. I will continue to pray for you that the Lord sends you another pastor soon with confidence that he will do so in his perfect timing. The God of peace be with you all in Christ, Pastor Jesse Johnston. So we'll have another voters meeting um, It'll be April 28th, Sunday. That's the Sunday after Easter, um, right after the last service, so 12, 12, 15 or so. Um, also, is um, maybe you notice a, a table of books in the entry area. That's the books from the women's ministry. Um, over the years, many different Bible classes that they've had and, and just had some extra books left over. If you want to take some, please do so. They have a box there. If you want to do, donate some money, that will go towards some missions. You're welcome to them. Then, uh, speaking of donations, last few weeks we had a door offering to help the Rob Mathias family. And uh, God certainly has opened a lot of hearts. The door offering was $3,000. Um, there is at least another additional $1,000 given online. And so with that matching um, plan, that brings it well over $7,000. So thank you very much for that. Also, some people have asked how they can help out the Dienick family. Michelle Dienick's funeral was yesterday. There is also a fund set up for the children of, of Michelle Dienick and that you can give to that fund online at trinitycrete.org. This ho coming week is Holy Week. A lot of opportunities to worship God. Um, Thursday night is Monday, Thursday, communion service at 3.30, again at 7 o'clock. Good Friday, we have a, a communion service at 3.30 in the afternoon. And then the Tenebrae, that service of darkness, just powerful service. That's at 6 o'clock Friday night and 7.30 also. And then, of course, Easter Sunday, normal services, 8, 9.30 and 11 with the Easter breakfast between services. And don't forget, if you have children or you know someone with children, the Easter egg hunt is Saturday at 10 o'clock. Uh, it'll be across the street, grade school building. Um, you can register for that online at trinitycrete.org. Uh, you don't have to register to come, but it, it is nice just so we know for planning-wise. And speaking of Holy Week then, that gives you and me great opportunity to reach out and invite people to come and worship the risen Savior. Um, they're going to be uh, handed out um, as you leave by an usher, a little tiny card, an invite card specific to Easter. If you haven't seen it already online, there are two videos that you can use to, to share and invite people. There's that I Love My Church video, very positive of, of what we are, a family of believers, and also a specific video regarding Holy Week, uh, the Tenebrae service and Easter Sunday. So please use all these opportunities to reach out. This is the most important week. What a great time then for someone who's never heard the story of Jesus to come and hear of salvation through Christ alone. That's it for the announcements. Have a blessed day.